an easy way out, though. No, but I, I like him. I like okay. him. Okay. I, I so take him on our team. Your team. You I like take him, him on our team, okay. yeah. I Just think, because, you know, he's got those qualities that we talk about, that we the yeah. parts we like of Jacob Peterson, except I think he's better at scoring goals. So, I mean, he's also like... The thing about Stephen Lenhart is Say it, whatever's he, on no, your mind, no, he, he, he realizes the player that he is, and he doesn't try to be something that he's not. He realizes that he's got a two or three inch advantage on everybody else on the field. He realizes that he is significantly stronger than everybody else on the field. He realizes that he's a better header of the ball uh, than anybody else on the field. And so, and credit to, to, to Frank Yallop, who is the head coach of the ball, and Mark Watson, uh, who, who is the head coach now, is they put his abilities and his skill set to use and make the most of it. They hit long balls to him all day long. He knocks them down for Chris Wondolowski. as their one chance of the game. I believe that, that's how that one came about. It is effective at times. It works sometimes. Uh, but I don't like him. I think that... <sighs> I'm trying to figure out a way to put this nicely. Just say it. There are, are far more talented players, I think, that are having minutes taken away by a guy who I know the objective is to win games for the San Jose Earthquakes Rick but Stephen Linhart is never going to become a better player than he is at the moment right now and that's the only thing for me is they've got a couple of young players that are not getting minutes um, but if he helps to win then you know who am I to say who cares all right, if you want to join us, give us your take. 913-491-8255 is the number. Again, 913-491-8255. Rick is up first tonight on the final whistle. What's going on, Rick? Rick, are you there? All right, no, Rick. We'll try to get the phone line sorted out. But if you want to join us, again, 913-491-8255. Um, by the way, I, I'm assuming from where you sat or on social media, you heard the chance directed at John Bush <laughs> from the Calder and all night. We need oh. to talk about that because the first show you and I did together was, was the it? origin of that chance. Was that the first? It was the first you and I did together for sure. Yeah. Okay. Here at Sporting Park, and that was John Bush slapping either the ball kid or slapping the ball out of the ball kid's hands. Either way, it was investigated by the league. There was talks of fines and suspensions. They got a game suspension. The Cauldron remembered. And yes, the chant of ball boy beater was every time a goal kick came up, even when Bush was on the south end of the stadium, which was nice. Yeah. And pretty, it, pretty funny. It wasn't a quiet chant either. There were a lot of people participating in that one because where I was sitting there, I was up in the press box, which is in the southwest corner of the stadium. I sat inside because it's cold out. Yes, whatever. Um, inside, windows closed, doors closed, everything. It, 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 it isolates a lot of sound from the outside. Uh, it insulates a lot of sound from the outside, I should say. Uh, it keeps that out, and very clearly, very loudly, the entire game, we heard ball boy beater, clap, 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 ball boy beater, the entire game. So, you know, credit to the Calder and credit to South Stand, everybody in the stadium that, that was going along with ball boy beater. I guarantee on his first goal kick, John Bush heard that and had a little bit of a giggle to himself so. and thought, you know what, there's nothing I can do about this. This is my fault. It's kind of funny, and it was. And, you know, it was funny because the chant started, and the first three or four times people around me were saying, what's that chant? What are they saying? Yeah. And then the, it just kind of spread from person to person, and the story was told, and then it got louder throughout the night. So okay, we have it was pretty funny. On, uh, call one you wonder if the ball kids got any special instruction out. tonight, <laughs> knowing, uh, knowing Bush was coming back to town. All right, we'll get to the phones. 913-491-8255 is the number. Let's try Rick again. What's going on, Rick? For the ball boy now. Oh, yeah. Ball boy's good ball now. Boy. The great call, Rick. Yeah, I guess what? The ball boy gets the last laugh in this scenario? Is that what we... I think he got the we last need, laugh we need, years ago. we need him to call in tonight. I mean, really, that's, that's what we He got the last for. laugh when he called into the, the post-game show two years ago, I thought, and told his side of the story and, and made John Bush look like a ball boy beater. By the way, I hope there's... I just is stupid, but I hope someone in the media asked John Bush about that after the game, yeah. or maybe that's an Andy Edwards article this week <laughs> on MLS Soccer. Let's turn back the clock and get a fresh quote from San Jose's goalkeeper. Anyway, that was just a funny nugget I had to work in because it really was 
uh, a funny part of the night. Okay, so we've talked about that. We've talked about the refs. We've talked about the goal for Sporting KC, the PK that should have been. How about San Jose's amazing chance in the 71st yeah. minute? And I'm not going to sit here and say Sporting KC got lucky because I don't no, think that was they did. What they got lucky on that, but I mean, yeah. is, in general, they deserve to win this match. But that's uh, I mean, for Wondolowski, that's one that he puts in the back of the net. What nine times out of ten at uh, least? That's like a Wando special. Ten out of ten. Ten out of ten. Wondolowski from eight yards, one on one with the keeper, no defenders in the way. Literally just has to pick a side of the goal and and, and slot it in. And that that's Wondolowski. 10 out of 10 times and how he pulled that wide uh, it's just a little bit it's a lack of confidence for him at the moment he's not scored goals uh late in 2013 last year he's not scored goals early this year and so you know he's struggling just a little bit at the moment and it's a nice time for sporting kansas city to to, to face that team to face that player uh they got away with a little one and, and the more that i think about it as we've gone on with the show i i have reeled myself back in just a tad bit from saying that they really really deserved it and if, if wondolowski uh, had scored that, it would have been an unfair result for Sporting Kansas City. And I come back to the fact that they still only created four chances that they were able to put on goal, and I don't know if, if that's enough to really say uh, they deserve to win that game no matter what. Uh, it was very, very close, uh, I think, in terms of the, the, the real good chances that, the, that were created in the game, and so it wouldn't have been an unjust result, I think, with Sporting Kansas City quite fortunate on that one because, uh, as I said, Wondolowski scored 27 goals just two seasons ago. And I bet you probably about half of them were from that exact same spot where he missed from tonight. One-on-one with the keeper, nobody in the way, he just pulled it. Wando also had a chance on a very dangerous free kick in the 82nd minute. I thought it was a terrible foul call just outside the penalty area, but nonetheless, uh, Wando cranks it up, just curled it high and wide. It looked like Kronberg probably had that four post cover, but uh, that was really the last scary moment of the match. Sporting KC really easily survived the last 10 minutes plus a couple extra stoppage time after that. And that was good because, you know, we were kind of joking on Wednesday night, but it's scary to think of Sporting KC has given up goals at the end of the last Don't say matches. that word. Don't say that G word. Do not say it. And then the Goonies come to Duh. town. I knew it was coming. And you just, I'm you're, so worried. you're worried about it. And I tried the reverse jinx. I was telling my friends, I was sitting by that San Jose always scores at the end and they never stop fighting because Goonies never say die. I'm so worried about them. And it was nice that that didn't happen. They really didn't get close in the last few minutes. Warden yeah. Casey did a nice job of killing off the game. Uh, Kevin Ellis and C.J. Spong just working down in the corner, killing off the clock. And it was nice not to have that stress at the end of the match. Credit to Peter Vermes on, on, on that, I think, the fact that he puts Lawrence Olin there in the starting lineup tonight. And so you've got a third guy with serious height. So, so you, when, when the long ball is played over the top to Stephen Linhart, and it's a little bit short. He's not going up against Yuri Rosell, who is maybe six foot and not much of an aerial presence. He's going up against Lawrence Olam, who is, for the entirety of his career until last year, is a center back. He's somebody who has the athleticism and the leaping ability to get up and if not win the ball from Linhart in the air, he's going to put him off just enough uh, to where he's not able to, to do, pick the direction, uh, the redirection of his header. He's not able to knock that down into the into the, the, the path of Wondolowski. And so uh, just having a third big body in there alongside Aurelian Collin and Ike Opara, who are probably better in the air, I would say, than, than Matt Beasler. Uh, they la obviously lack in, in, in many other categories behind Matt Beasler. But in terms of that, I thought it was a very, very good lineup that, that Vermees put out defensively and everything. Chance Myers not able to go again. But getting Sasanovic back once again, how good that guy is and how we are unable to at all to quantify what Seth Sinovic does for this team and how important he is to this team. It, 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 how a player can be that underrated, it, it, it's really hard to wrap my head around because he's not there on Wednesday night against Cruz Azul, and they get absolutely torched down, yes, down both the right and the left side. Yeah. But he comes in tonight, and he's going up uh, against a fairly good uh, pair of guys on the right side in Cordell Cato and, 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 and uh, Tiba Harris. Nothing, not, an, not a thing from those two all night long. From a team that likes to get the ball down the sides and whip the crosses in, nothing came from that, that left side of defense for Sporting Kansas City. I'd like to say it was a nice bounce back game for Kevin Ellis as well because he had a real bad game at Cruz Azul. Yep. But didn't, I mean, he looked confident from the opening whistle tonight and no real scary moments on his side of the field either. Well, that's the great thing about a young player like that is 
you're just so happy to be out there playing. You've got a really short memory. And Kevin Ellis was probably able to let go of that game pretty quickly when Peter Vermees said, well, hey, dude, uh, you know, Saturday night we got that game. You're going to be back in the lineup, so I need you to focus on that really, really quickly. Uh, he's probably able to put that behind him and forget about it. And so what that does is it helps you move on very quickly and not dwell on that. And that goes into uh, getting the victory tonight, not having to, to, to you know, go a second or third disappointing game in a row and just forget about everything that bad bad that happened last week against Dallas, against Cruz Azul. Everything is, is gone now, and they can really look forward individually and as a team, and Kevin Ellis is a perfect example of that. One more specific play I'd like to talk about um, before we start to look ahead to Colorado. Uh, 18th minute, crazy play. Um, by the way, Sal Zizo involved in this. I thought he had another nice game yep. for Sporting KC. I'd much rather see him in the starting lineup to Jacob Peterson. I'm not going to dwell on that, but... Uh, Sestinovic on a on a throw in and did a nice job feel, filling in for Beesler on those long throws. Um, ends up with a header that's saved off the line. Nice play by San Jose. But then Zizo with the blast that clanks off the post. Very close to a goal there. And then Eichelpar with the rebound. If he would have been going a little bit slower, he maybe could have controlled that secondary tap and put it easily in the open net. Instead, it bounces just wide. That was an insane play that could have given Sporting KC an early control of the match. Yeah, insane and 100% and should have been a goal for Mike Opara. Let me ask you this question, Dave, and you remember this play very, very well. That tonight for Mike Opara or Kai Kamara in 2010? Oh, no. Kai's was way worse. Really? How so? Well, Kai was in the very middle of the goal on the goal line with no goalie in front of him. At least at least Bush is like in the view and Ike's like moving forward and the ball's coming off the post towards him. Like Ike's was yeah. pretty easy too, but you know what? I before when I asked you I wanted to argue the counterpoint of it and and just for argument's sake. But then you just reminded me of the ridiculousness that will, that was that Kai Kamara play. And the fact that he knocks the ball in, he does so with his arm. By yes, ball. He did. Yeah, it <laughs> still one for Mike Opara that, that if, you know, they don't eventually get that goal from Dom Dwyer later in the game, Mike Opara is probably really, really hanging his head and just thinking, man, how could I screw that chance up? It gets washed away a little bit. But, yeah, Kai Kamara, that – I'll never forget. That. I'll never forget where I was. I'll, you know, I w was there at Community America Ballpark that night. That was bad. That was very, very. Bad. I actually tried to find that on uh, YouTube a couple it's weeks everywhere. ago. Yeah, it's a uh, pretty good one. Um, but speaking of Zizo, like I said, he had a, he had a, I thought he had a nice game. He would be in my, you know, top eleven lineup right now. Is now the Champions League has passed and we're starting to focus more on MLS. You would think. You know, with Chance Myers, the possible exception, still fighting back from injury, we should see pretty close to Peter Vermees' ideal 11 next week at Colorado. You know, what does that look like? I think we know Kronberg will be in there. Colin and Beasler still, right, even yeah, though even yeah. though Opar is a, a good player. We got Sinovic. We got Myers if he's healthy. Uh, it gets a little more unknown after that. I mean, do you still look at it? So. But do you look at Zussi forward pretty much every game? Yep. And then maybe Dwyer and Beeler alternate games? Or how do you think that works in the center forward? Well, first of all, before we even get to that, uh, it's worth pointing out that the fact that both of these teams played Wednesday night in Champions League. Both of them were knocked out. San Jose had to go extra time and then penalties uh, at a higher altitude, actually, than Mexico City was. And so they were as tired as Sporting Kansas City would have been tonight. They would have been just about as tired. And the fact that Sporting Kansas City could make five changes from that, the lineup they put out Wednesday night. We thought that was an absolute A lineup for the most part because they were really going after Champions League. The fact they can make five changes and then still come out with, a, with the lineup that they did tonight, put, put enough good players out there and still get a victory and really control a game for 90 minutes, uh, that says a lot about where they are at versus where the Earthquakes are at. They make four changes, and two of them are bringing in their best center back pairing, Goodson and Bernardes, who did not play on Wednesday. And then they're running basically everybody else out there that they did on Wednesday night for 120 minutes and penalties. Uh, so, so the depth for Sporting Kansas City played a huge factor tonight, uh, I thought, the fact that they had those fresh bodies to bring in that didn't start or didn't play on Wednesday. And so, yeah, Peter Vermees will have those kind of options going forward now as we're getting back to a game next Saturday, a game the following Saturday, a week off after that, a game on a Saturday. And it's not this Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday anymore. Yeah, he'll have to pick and choose where he, he rotates guys in and out because Dom Dwyer has, okay, the final product's not been there, and I think this team is better with Claudio Biela on the, on the field. 
But Don Dwyer deserves minutes. He, he, when he's out there, he is constantly working to make things happen. He's not just out there running around doing nothing. Uh, he's working to make things happen, and so he deserves minutes. He needs minutes. You need a second center forward as well. And so yeah, they'll probably. It'll, I would imagine. For every two games, Claudio Bieler starts, Dom Dwyer gets one. That's how I would handle it. I, I just think Dwyer, or excuse me, the, the Bieler is the, the better center forward. He's, he's more likely to find you a goal in any game. He's more likely to find you a goal out of nothing as well. I see Benny Thalhaber, Paolo Nagamura, and Yuri Rosell as the, the midfield three. And when you have everybody healthy, when you have everybody uh, on a full week's rest, I see Graham Zussi as a winger unless you are playing a team that's very, very soft in the midfield and they're playing a 4-4-2. Then I think you can get away with Zussi and Failhaber in there together, as we saw against Seattle. That was a good pairing in that game. Only two guys in the middle. You lose a little bit of, of, of the, the, the bite, if you will, in the midfield from, from taking out an Agamura or Roselle, uh, the ball winning. But you can overrun them with possession at that point. And then take your pick, Salzizo or, or CJ Sapong on the left slash right wing, flipping with, with Zussi, whoever's there. Both offer, I think, really great aspects to the game. If, if Dwyer's going to be in there, I think it's probably Zizo on the wing. If it's going to be Bieler in there, it's probably Sapong. He can hold that ball up, and then he can release Claudio Bieler, who's more likely to get him behind the back line. Uh, there's a ton of options, a ton of different pieces, a ton of different ways that Peter Vermees can play every single game. It's going to be similar to the last couple of years. He's going to have to make the right choices, push the right buttons, pull the right strings at the right time. Uh, he, he showed late in the season, and especially in the playoff run last year, that he can do that. Uh, he, he, he kind of figured it out just a little bit. So, you know, we'll see We'll see what happens over the coming weeks. I, I know what your answer is going to be to this question, but is there any scenario where we get Bieler and Dwyer on the field at the same time? I know neither one uh, ideally would be suited to a role other than center forward, but at the same time you can make a case these are the two best goal scorers on the team. And the fact that they're not on the field at the same time and the team isn't doing great offensively. If the team gets into a slump, I think fans will start calling and asking about that. Uh, any chance Dwyer gets out on the wing or Bieler plays in that attacking mid role we saw in preseason? I mean, do you think we'll see that much, if at all, this year? Yeah, that's the more likely one for me. Is Dwyer, kind of, or excuse me, Bieler dropping into the hole right behind Dwyer? We did see it in the preseason, as you said. Uh, and and Claudio Bieler is very had a very very good preseason statistically. Yeah, he had five goals, six assists. Now let's put a little bit of an asterisk. I think three of the assists came against Indy 11, which is an NASL team, a second division team, an expansion team in an ASL uh, while we're at it. Uh, but, but he was effective in there. He, she, he looked like a player who was comfortable in that spot as well. He played there a, as a youngster when he was back in Ecuador. And so, yeah, I, I think we could see that, but probably only in the event of an injury, uh, whether it's Zussi or Failhaber, and then you get yourself into a situation where uh, you just need another fresh pair of legs uh, to, to, to play as kind of your number 10. But he does have that ability. Look at the pass he played to, to Kevin Ellis for the goal against Cruz Azul, the outside of the foot uh, curler, and, and dropped it right onto the toe of Kevin Ellis, and he made everything happen from there. Uh, but he's got the quality. I think he's an underrated passer of the ball. He's an underrated reader of the game. And, and as someone who uh, just has a feel for everything, knows when to push it, knows when to slow it down, you know, that, that, that veteran uh, leadership that he brings to the team and, and the having been there and done it before, uh, I, I think that counts for a lot. Andy Greenenbaum came in. I think a lot of people expected he might challenge for the starting role. It was given Eric Kronberg. He's performed pretty well so far. Do you think we'll see Greenenbaum rotated in at all, or do you think he's more at this point for Open Cup, Champions League? Yeah, I think he's the only guy in the roster that hasn't played at all yet. I mean, what, do you think he fits in at all to give Kronberg a rest, or do you think we'll see Eric for pretty much every regular season game? Yeah, I'm pretty surprised that we haven't seen Greenbaum at, at all. I thought when he was brought in, it was more than as just a, as strictly a backup. I, I thought as a guy who, who's got almost 100 MLS games under his belt, competing against Eric Kronberg, who I think at the time had five, uh, I thought he would get some games, he would get some minutes, but but I can't I can't fault Peter Vermees for what he's done. Uh, he's made a decision, an educated decision, I'm sure, along with John Pascarella, the goalkeeping coach, that this is our guy and we're going to stick with him. We're not going to shatter his confidence by him having one bad game, two bad games, one bad play, whatever. We're not going to immediately pull him and put somebody else in there, and then you put Greenabom in a situation where he thinks, well, if I make a mistake, he's going to pull me just as quick and it's going to be Kronberg back in there. He's picked a guy and he's stuck with him, and I think that's important. Uh, when, you, when, when you're having to pick a new starting goalkeeper, when you have to transition away from, from Jimmy Nielsen the last four years, 
I still think Greenbaum is, is, is a very good option if you have to go to him if Kronberg is hurt. Uh, but, yeah, I would expect at this point it's probably going to be Kronberg for 32 regular season games. Greenbaum probably gets the early U.S. Open Cup games, maybe the, the, those group stages in, mm -hmm. in the, the Champions League once we hit August, September, and October. Uh, but it, it, at the moment, it is 100% Eric Kronberg's job, and I think he's done well. He got a lot of flack on Wednesday night for a guy who really didn't get a whole heck of a lot of help from anybody in the back line, and he had a, he had a lot to do. And I thought he was better than people gave him credit for, and I thought he was good again tonight. He had the one chance at, at the end, the, the long lofted ball over the top, and, and I don't know if you remember this play exactly or not, Dave, but it was 88th or so minute, mm -hmm. free kick from midfield from the Earthquakes, bearing right towards the head of Steven Linhart. He goes up over the top of Linhart, catches it, and, 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 and falls to the ground with it in his hand. That's a play that if Jimmy Nielsen's in goal, he's never, ever coming off his line. He's never making that leap. He's never catching that ball. And suddenly there's a ball bouncing around inside the six-yard box, and that's how late goals get scored, uh, especially against the Earthquakes. That's how they do it. And so I think there's a lot of, a of aspects to his game and traits uh, that are much different than Jimmy Nielsen, not necessarily better or worse, but different. And people have – it'll take time to get used to that. Sporting Casey's next match at Colorado, Saturday at 5 p.m. Central Time. Just give the fans a quick scouting report on Colorado and what you think this matchup offers for us next weekend. Well, Colorado, they surprised me today. Uh, they were playing at home against Portland, who you know everybody expects to, to, to be as good or even better than they were in 2013. Uh, they lost Oscar Pereja in the offseason, their head coach, who really put together a really, really good team uh, in, a, in a very, very good system as well. And they go out there to today in their home opener against the Rapids. They win 2-0. Yeah. Granted, it's on a pair of penalties about two minutes apart from one another. Uh, Donovan Ricketts is sent off for, for, for Portland in the second half, and so things got out of hand a little bit. Uh, but I just think they're, they're a solid team. Uh, they're they're, they're going to be very sound defensively under Pablo Mastorini, a defensive midfielder, during his playing days. And so that, that will be the basis of their team. I think they'll ultimately end up playing a lot like Sporting Kansas City do. Uh, everything will be based around that midfield, winning the ball and keeping possession, uh, being strong at the back. And so they will be a, a tougher team, uh, I think, to break down. The advantage that Sporting Kansas City probably has is – as we know from the last couple of years, Sporting Kansas City is so, so good on the road because teams are forced to play a little bit more when they're at their place and they can't sit back and, and, and play the defensive soccer at home. And so Sporting will have more chances. There will be more open gaps, and it will be up to them at that point to create, and this is what we talked about earlier, more good chances, not just semi-half chances crosses the ball, of the ball into the box. Create those good chances. You do that, goals will come. I don't care how good a, a defensive team you're going up against, especially on the road for sporting. They led the league in, in wins and points on the road last season. I'd expect uh, a very good performance from them again next week. And it'd be a disappointment if they don't get a result against a team that's somewhere in that 4-7 to seven range in the Eastern Conference. Maybe a playoff team, maybe not. And we know altitude's always something to watch out there. We saw Sporting KC get gassed at Cruz Azul in the second half on Wednesday. I think we've seen in the past where uh, Sporting KC could play well for 60 minutes at Colorado and then fade a little bit, so that's something we'll be watching. The good news, Sporting KC has a week to rest up. They haven't really had that, so a full week to rest up. We should see close to the first team uh, first choice lineup for Peter Vermees next weekend. Well, a big win tonight for Sporting. 1-0 over the San Jose Earthquakes. Dom Dwyer with a goal on a penalty kick in the 57th minute. And Eric Kronberg gets the clean sheet. Sporting KC, their first win of the year. Again, they're back in action next Saturday at 5 o'clock at Colorado. Andy and I will be back with you afterwards for the final whistle postgame show. Thanks to our producer back in the studio. Thanks to the callers and... Again, congrats to Sporting KC, a 1-0 win tonight over San Jose. When it comes to your finances, do you believe in the Thanks. power?